Greetings, uh, everybody uh, on YouTube. Welcome back to another video. Uh, it's Piotr speaking, and this time around, we're going to be talking to an issue that is quite close to my heart, mainly because I've been working on it professionally. Well, a little bit, maybe. That's a bit of a strong word, interning, perhaps more likely. But um, uh, the topic of this video is the United Nations. Now, the UN is not exactly an enigma. It's something that a lot of us reference a lot, but I think there's quite a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to just how capable the UN is, uh, what its mandates are, what it can do, what it can't do, um, and just generally how it's constructed. When we think of the UN, we mainly think of the Security Council with the five permanent members and that all infamous veto. But joining me today to make sense of the UN in 2023, at least specifically, uh, is well, he's my former supervisor, actually. Okay, should I say boss? I'm not sure. But uh, Richard Goen, he is the UN Director of International Crisis Group, uh, an organization that I hold in high regard. And we've had a few other fellow staff members, colleagues of Richard's on the show before. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, like the video, share it if you appreciate the conversation. Um, because at the end of the day, the UN is one of those organizations that can influence us, even if we don't think it can. Um, but Richard, so first question is, very important one is, how much do you miss me having not been at, uh, you know, in the team since 2021? I'm uh, joking. I, I, I cannot <laughs> describe how much I miss you, Piotr. It's, it's wonderful to see your face again. Oh, okay. Now I know he's just talking nonsense. But um, no, okay. Serious question is, uh, you know, we've got some broader questions, but I think the first question I want to know from you is what can we expect or not expect? Uh, from the UN in 2023? What's its mandate? What's generally on the agenda? Could you take us through a little bit of that? And then we can... Well, look, I think there are two big overarching challenges facing the UN in 2023. And the first of those, rather predictably, is Russia's continuing war on Ukraine. And uh, Russia's war on Ukraine dominated UN diplomacy Last year, um, the Security Council met about 50 times on the war. Um, and I think we've got to assume that that will continue to be the case for as long as there is uh, a conflict ongoing in Ukraine. And it does look like the war could run well beyond this year. I think the second issue, um, and one that is maybe getting less attention in the West, but is getting a lot of attention in other parts of the world, is um, how we are doing on international development and poverty eradication. Because given the economic shocks of COVID and also Ukraine, there are real fears now that uh, UN members are slipping on their commitments to fight extreme poverty, um, to promote economic growth around the world. And there's going to be a big summit um, in New York in September uh, on on development. And I think we're going to get a, a lot of pressure from African countries, from Asian countries, and Latin American countries, um, saying, don't just focus on Ukraine, Ukraine is serious, but poverty is serious too. Uh, there's going to be some pushback against the West if it focuses solely on Ukraine in the UN. So one of the things that you um, you wrote in a in an article, um, Richard is also a frequent contributor to World Politics Review uh, mm -hmm. and a couple of other major um, outlets, which we will share in the show notes of this uh, video, but also in the Twitter space. Um, is you know uh, this this role of the global south? Uh, you know, early on in the conflict, for for people who don't recall, uh, there was a lot of conversation or or you know rhetoric around uh, the sort of forgetting of. Um, you know, how the UN has come about, its relationships to the uh, colonialist era, the, the, the capacity for dominant powers to still be of that period. Um, what what role, I think one of the main points you raised in your article was about the role of the Global South, the non-aligned movement, if we sort of want to talk about that. Uh, there is a subset of a question I want to go to you on on specifically the Security Council. But just before that, building on, on what you just mentioned there, how much do you see um, non sort of, should we say, Western, non advanced economies playing into the narrative of the UN's agenda? Well, you know, last year there was just a huge amount of media attention to some big votes in the UN General Assembly um, around the war. So in March, there was a, uh, a vote condemning Russia's aggression. Um, and then in October, there was another big vote. Uh, rejecting President Putin's claim to be annexing parts of Ukraine. And those votes were sort of taken as tests of global public opinion about the war. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in each of those cases, actually, UN members with large majorities stood up and sided with Ukraine. In, in each case, about 140 of the UN's 193 members supported the Ukrainian position, whereas just three or four countries supported Russia. Mm -hmm. um, so at one level, it looks like the international community, whatever that is, is um, quite supportive of Kiev. But um, there are some notable exceptions. Uh, China, India, South Africa um, abstained on all those votes. I think there is concern in Brussels, concern in DC, that some really key players outside the West are inclined to tilt towards Russia. And actually, we just saw Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister in South Africa, where he got quite a warm reception from um, the South African foreign minister. Uh, so there's a, a lot of attention to how the global south is behaving. And look, there's going to be another test of that almost certainly at the end of February. It'll be the first anniversary of Russia's all out invasion of Ukraine. Almost certainly the Ukrainians and their friends will table another big resolution condemning Russia. We'll all be watching the votes and we'll be seeing does the same level of support for Kiev persist? From the perspective of a lot of the countries we're talking about, the real agenda and their real concerns are not Ukraine related. Um, it's more about, as I said, development. It's also about um, a lingering resentment over the unfair distribution of global vaccines. Um, there's a lot of resentment that Western countries have promised money Climate to the global south for for climate, well, climate adaptation, others would want climate reparations, but mm -hmm. climate change broadly. Yeah. Um, and so actually what's motivating the the non-aligned countries is resentment about these economic global issues that is not rooted in Ukraine, but it's actually been the votes on Ukraine that have suddenly focused a lot of attention on how the global south uh, feels about the UN. And it's mm -hmm. given their, their voice and their votes more prominence than was the case before. So, so that's one of the things that I think a lot of people perhaps um, misunderstand um, about how the UN works is, is that, you know, there are regional issues, but there are also thematic ones, right? And they can be, uh, well, compartmentalized or whatever, uh, separated into these different buckets, if we want to call it that. Um, but um, there was a lot of um, frustration and I think resentment over the, the disproportionate amount of attention that Ukraine got and continues to get. You mentioned it in your article about, you know, the fact that Ethiopia, not many people know this, Ethiopia is the bloodiest war in terms of actual casualties and lives lost relative to Ukraine. Ukraine's had the biggest ramifications globally because of the actors involved. But, you know, there, there is this um, disconnect. So, you know... Building on that compartmentalization point, um, could you take us through a little bit where we have actually seen surprisingly still, um, I don't know if alignment is the right word, but actual, uh, you know, the Russians have voted in favor of things over, say, Afghanistan, um, uh, Ethiopia, a couple of Syria. They haven't blocked, at least they've abstained, I think, on a couple of things. But other than that, they haven't utilized their veto outside of Ukraine that much. I was wondering if you can outline that for the audience and listeners. Yeah, well, this this is the theme that I've been tracking closely over the last year, because obviously, you know, when the 24th of February happened, when Russia launched its assault on on Ukraine, um, there was a big question about whether this would uh, create a sort of a, a flood of poison that would basically infect all diplomacy in New York and whether the West's um, rift with russia would sort of undermine uh the un not just in response to you to the ukrainian situation but much more broadly and it's worth saying that you know the poison is very very real um western countries have been working quite hard to try and keep russia out of uh, various un committees um, now, that includes high profile bodies like the UN Human Rights Council, but it also includes committees on things like road safety. And so there's sort of a general um, pushback against the Russian presence in the UN. Uh, the Russians, meanwhile, have uh, tried to get some UN officials who've criticized their behavior thrown out. I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of diplomatic um, uh, skirmishing, okay. skirmishing, yeah, if you will, to and froing. Um, but what I find really interesting is that when it comes to the Security Council, all the main powers 
seem to have come to a tacit agreement that they're not going to let the poison of Ukraine infect cooperation in other areas. Um, so we've actually seen the Security Council pass in the last year quite significant resolutions on things like keeping the UN in Afghanistan to deal with the Taliban, setting up a new sanctions regime targeting gangs in Haiti, you know, creating a new framework for the African Union to do stabilization operations in Somalia. Uh, on a lot of these issues, the Russians have either abstained and just not got in the way of UN decision making, or they've been actively supportive of UN action. So, you know, this is one diplomatic channel which does still seem to be working. Now, why? I think partially it's because Russia wants to, you know, doesn't want to look like a total spoiler on the world stage. That would actually play into the West's narrative. Um, interestingly, we hear that behind the scenes, the Chinese have been quite active lobbying the Russians, um, telling them not to act as total spoilers. On the Western side, it's been the French who have been trying to build bridges a lot of the time. The French have been telling the US and the UK not to push the Russians too hard. I mean, what, what we're seeing overall is quite an interesting example of um, the big powers building a firewall between what is a, you know, a very direct, clearly um, enormous conflict and cooperation in other areas and using the UN as a matrix for that, which has been has been fascinating to observe, but I don't think has got a lot of uh, a lot of coverage in the wider media. So, OK, um, I think that's a critical point that I want to underline there for listeners is that, you know, multilateralism, particularly at the highest level, i.e. the UN or at least most comprehensive is, is is very different to bilateral or even sort of, you know, smaller trilateral, whatever it is, forms that you can get. Um, very interesting about the Chinese there. So we are seeing that they are doing some, what would you say, backdoor diplomacy um, behind the scenes, uh, whilst it doesn't look like they're doing much, at least tangibly. You know, they've made a lot of statements about their support for Russia, not on support of NATO, but they're not followed through with sort of materialistic military support to the Russians. Um, could you take us through a little bit more, the, the specifically, you know, the great power politic dimensions there? Uh, you know, India, I don't think, is discussed enough in these elements, despite it having quite a role in potentially a Taiwan situation. Uh, they do still engage with the Russians quite a lot through trade and stuff, but the Americans want them not to and, and so on. So could you just take us through the sort of the big powers and, and how they're sort of doing things, if that makes sense? Because I think that's something that a lot of people are particularly curious about. Well, you, you highlight um, China and India and you know this this is especially interesting because you know obviously out beyond the UN bubble out there out there in the real world um we see india moving closer to the us and uh, simultaneously us china tensions rising but actually back in the un bubble back in my esoteric little world things looked slightly different last year so india was on the security council last year um but it consistently refused to join in Security Council votes or General Assembly votes um, condemning Russia. Uh, it, it stood back and abstained. And there are a number of reasons for that. But one of them is that, uh, you know, India has economic and military ties to Russia that it doesn't want to sacrifice. Um, and then also, I think the Indians... Uh, felt very resentful because you know over the last couple of years they had seen the west pull out of afghanistan creating you know huge regional security problems for delhi and so the indian view was well you know you just created a massive security crisis on our doorstep um why should we be offering you support when you have a security crisis on your doorstep hmm. um so you know the indians didn't side with um the us and europeans in in new york over, over ukraine by contrast, the the Chinese, I mean, I, I think China has made, uh, and probably made about 10 years ago, a strategic determination that um, a well-functioning UN is in its interests. And there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, China, for example, has sort of co-opted parts of the UN development system to promote its Belt and Road Initiative. Well, and bang, China... I mean... The World Bank has had a fair amount of influence on the Chinese in recent years. Sorry. Uh, no, no. I mean, <laughs> but, but, but China sees China sees the multilateral system as basically facilitating its rise. It it doesn't want 
um, the multilateral system to implode under it. It wants to make big changes to the multilateral system, for example, by limiting UN talk about human rights, but it still wants you know, the UN there. And I think in the case of the Security Council, China thinks that having a functioning council is helpful to it on um, issues like Afghanistan on its on its periphery. And I think that Beijing was very nervous that Russia's behavior would crash the council and also that China would be sort of guilty by association with, with Moscow if it was seen to be supporting uh, Russia and crashing the council. Um, and so... Yeah, I mean, the, the the Chinese sort of attitude has been generally to abstain in public, sometimes in recent months sort of speak out against the possibility of nuclear use in Ukraine. And then behind the scenes, the Chinese have talked, and they've talked to the Americans, but they've been talking to a lot of interlocutors like Norway, which was a European member of the council last year, basically saying, like, how do, how do we keep this under control? How do we contain this problem? <laughs> if you're on YouTube... Please subscribe and like the video, share it. Uh, all that helps with these new channels uh, as we uh, as we take the global gambit, uh, the podcast that I started in because of the events of Ukraine less than 10 months ago uh, as we embark on the video format as well. Uh, but Richard, since we're focusing on the Security Council, I do want to ask a, a particular question about that, which is, um, well, two questions about it. One, prospects for reform. Because obviously this this is something that's been touted since, well, you know, 1945, um, which is, you know, how much can the Security Council be reformed to better reflect the modern day international system, right? Uh, Britain and France are not the countries that they were. Um, India has overtaken the UK in economic growth, you know, um, but we don't have, you know, we have the G4. So the India, Japan, Germany and Brazil, I think, who, you know, often pushing to be represented in some way. But then there's the question of if you get India in the council do you need pakistan to counterbalance so what are the prospects for reform in the security council specifically because that's the one that gets all the all the press all the all the contention around it is it just hot air at this point even though we've seen the american french acknowledge it in the past few months well there certainly has been a lot of talk about security council reform uh of course there's always a lot of talk about security council reform around the un it's sort of uh, a theme that never goes away but it has gained a lot of momentum uh over the last 10 11 months precisely because of the council's inability to deal with the ukrainian situation and, right. and russia's aggression um now that was definitely reinforced when joe biden in his speech to the annual general assembly um meeting in in september said that the u.s wanted to see reform and although the u.s has in the past uh said it supports reform and biden didn't say very much that was substantively new the mm -hmm. mere fact that you had a u.s president uh standing in up in front of his peers having just been to see the queen's funeral uh sort of gave you know did sort of create a lot of excitement in new york you know there was this feeling of is was this a real a real breakthrough on security council reform uh since then we haven't actually seen a whole lot of further progress um the us is conducting consultations mm -hmm. diplomats are genuinely divided they they don't they don't know uh whether the us is serious about this or whether it was really just a uh uh a gesture um to try and get some diplomatic goodwill last last september i mean my my overall gut feeling is that we're going to see discussions of security council reform rumble on through the coming year and rumble on into 2024 mm -hmm. um there is going to be a big uh conference in september 2024 at the un with the exciting title the summit of the future which Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, wants to use as a sort of a moment for everyone to reflect on multilateralism. Clearly, countries that want permanent seats on the Council, like India, are going to use the run up to that summit to say now is the moment. Now we have to change the structure of the UN. But um, I, for good or ill, have now been around the UN for nearly 20 years. Oh, boy. Um, is, uh, that, yes. a, is uh, that a good idea? Are you sure you know what you're doing? I, I, well, it's, it's why I, I look so... <laughs> So young and healthy. You look, you um, look but, sprightly as anything, Richard. Yeah, but I, I mean, I arrived in New York actually back in 2005, just in the run up to the big 2005 World Summit, right? Um, which was another moment when, after the US invasion of Iraq, there was a huge amount of talk about Security Council reform. And that it did look for a moment as if council reform might be possible. 
But then when it came to the final political bargaining, it all fell apart. And I, I have to say, my, my gut feeling is that we're going to be talking about council reform for two years. And then when it comes to the crunch, there just won't be a political agreement on what to do. And right. we'll probably have to wait another 20 years and then we'll probably go through the same rigmarole again after whatever crisis hits us um, in two decades from now. But do you not find that that is... I mean, I'm not saying you have the answer. I mean, as I say, I think you're the preeminent person to go to who's independent of the UN. But like, you know, the fact that we cannot seem to see any movement at all like you know, there's I, I I've you know when I've hosted conversations with people and people are like, well, you're the UN expert. I'm like, no, not really, <laughs> but like, well, relative. But like, the point is that I always try and say, well, you know, maybe we, uh, you know, put it this way. So why why can't Russia be kicked off the council, or why can't Russia be frozen out of the council? You know, the mechanisms just simply aren't there. It's not like sort of you know there is a difference between suspension and um, expulsion, right? Um, of the council, but there just doesn't seem to be any mechanism at all. And all this fanfare around Ukraine taking potentially Russia's seat, you know, um, through this, I have to admit, quite clever sort of bit of background research and investigations the Ukrainian delegation did, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem feasible. So what, 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 what is most feasible? Only in the Human Rights Council we can see improvements or, or, or nothing? Because it just otherwise it just really undermines the legitimacy or capacity for the UN to do anything, no? Or am I just being overly pessimistic for once? On on the specific on on the range of ideas that a lot of smart international lawyers have come up with for getting Russia out of the Security Council or out of the UN, I don't think we want to go down all those those rabbit holes. But having looked at them last year and having talked to people who really understand uh, the laws and procedures involved, I'm pretty convinced none of them work. I mean, if I were if I were the Ukrainian mission to the UN. I would continue to say that Russia's place in the council is illegitimate. Of course I would. I mean, it's a strong campaign line and um, it resonates uh, well beyond the UN bubble. But I, I actually think that if you if you look into the details, Russia's hold on its seat is, is pretty firm. And clearly that does that does have reputational con consequences for mm. for the Security Council. It would be absurd not to to deny that. I mean, I think sort of zooming out to the broader question of um, UN reform. I mean, this, this is something I, I've worked on quite a lot. I, I, uh, I would like that bit of my life back um, because it, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it the, the debates involved are, are tortuous and circular. Um, in principle, of course, India should have a seat. You know, of course, I, I would argue that Japan should have a seat. Um, but there are just so many political obstacles to any of these changes that the chances of success are very low. But I think I would also add that when you talk to diplomats around New York, um, those those who are cynical about this say, leave Security Council reform alone. It's a non-starter. It's actually a distraction. Let's talk about um, the sort of reforms we would like to see that would address our concerns. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, reform to the IMF. Um, in DC or the World Bank in DC, for a lot of developing countries, what they what they would really want out of a multilateral reform process is changes in decision making rules in the international financial institutions, which would give the developing world more say over um, you know World World Bank loans or or IMF loans, because that's actually much more relevant to their current economic conditions um, than. You know, the Security Council making a statement about X or Y. So, you know, I think we will be talking about Security Council reform for the next two years quite intensively. But I would also be listening very closely to what people like Mia Motley, um, the uh, Prime Minister of Barbados, is saying about the need for IFI reform, because actually that may also end up gaining more momentum um, because that's what a lot of the world wants. I mean, when it comes to the World Bank reforms, don't worry, I'm on my way out anyway. So 
um you know any of the major shifts that they need to do there um uh, are probably a systemic risk is 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 departing but um yeah i think uh, i think that a lot of that is very true in 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 and but what i think is also interesting is that some of the biggest change or like um notable points around change can come from some of the least likely areas right it's not the big dominant major powers it's barbados it's um independent envoys or or goodwill ambassadors that have actually produced quite a lot of sometimes substantial or notable, at least by UN terms, change, right? Um, so what about then um, Guterres himself? You know, you wrote in your article that he's quite a cautious person. He's a bit of a fence sitter. Um, and if we think we get frustrated with all of Schultz of Germany being sort of non-committal to certain things over Ukraine, I certainly feel frustrated with Antonio Guterres as Secretary General over certain things. Don't get me wrong. I, I think he's a, a good leader uh, and I respect him greatly. But I, I have been frustrated at times with some of the um, lack of uh, proaction, if that's a word, he's done on certain files. Could you just uh, how is he, I don't know, perceived amongst uh, the UN system more broadly? And, and, you know, I know Martin Griffiths has taken on the role of Mark Lowcock, who we actually had on the podcast about six months ago. Um, just curious for your thoughts on sort of the upper echelons of of the, uh, well, the, the, the secretariat uh, for the audience, if they're not familiar. Yeah, yeah. so um, Antonio Guterres, I mean, his his performance during the war to date, um, I, I think it, you know, it divides opinion um, because actually uh, I would say that he has handled the conflict, he's handled the war pretty well, especially given the limitations that he inevitably faces, given the fact that, you know, this is a conflict involving the big powers in the Security Council. What, what Guterres has done is he hasn't tried to table any grand peace plans. Um, instead, he's focused on taking limited steps to mitigate uh, the effects of the conflict. Um, and that has included things like negotiating the evacuation of civilians um, from the Azov-style steelworks in Mariupol, which you will remember was under siege in the spring of last year. His his biggest win um, was the Black Sea Grain Initiative, this deal by which um, Ukraine is allowed to uh, ship grain out of Odessa and other ports in the Black Sea. Um, and some of that grain goes to the developing, uh, hungry countries in the developing world. Mm -hmm. um, the UN is continuing to work on the safety of nuclear sites, um, You know, looking for ways to get security agreements about how to safeguard nuclear sites on the front line in the war. So th this is the sort of stuff that Guterres is doing. It's, it's not about bringing peace, um, it's about mitigating the conflict. Now, I think this this is the right approach, given the limitations he faces, but clearly there are um, others who feel that he should be taking a higher profile political um, role and really pushing for peace. Uh, Mexico, for example, back in the, the fall of last year, suggested that Guterres should um, team up with the Pope and Prime Minister Modi of <laughs> India for a big peace drive. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of diplomats sort of feel that, you know, it's, it's fine for Guterres to act as fixer in chief, but, you know, he's got to step up and be a peacemaker. His instinct has been the time is not yet right. Um, neither Russia or Ukraine is willing to talk peace now. They both think they can win on the battlefield, whatever victory looks like. Um, and he doesn't want to waste his political capital with a quixotic peace drive that will fail. He would rather right. stand back and wait for be a better opportunity to come. Now, overall, I agree with those calculations. Overall, I think he's taking the right approach, but it does inevitably set him up for a bit of criticism. In in the meantime, again, there are lots of voices from Africa and elsewhere who are saying, well, you know, he's doing, he's doing all this work around the Black Sea Grain Initiative, but what is he doing now about the worsening security situation in the Sahel? What is he doing about the um, collapse of Haiti? Um, so he, he also has to be aware that there are, you know, observers in parts of the world beyond Europe who think that he shouldn't devote too much time to Ukraine. Um, uh, in addition to those within Europe who would, would wish he was doing more. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, like, do all that fancy jazz, leave a comment. Do you agree with Richard or not? Um, how much do you like my shirt today versus the one I wore last episode? You know, important questions. Um, but with that, uh, Richard, so, okay, uh, I've got one final sort of, you know, 
aspirational ideological question for you but before that i want to be a bit more technical so you know a, a lot of people don't understand again how the un works how it's constructed i think some of the biggest wins of the un have been from its field organizations like the world food program the unhcr what about the transnational issues that are facing us this year um you know the remnants of covid you mentioned it in the opening remarks you know there's a lot of anger about uh, vaccine diplomacy climate change but also terrorism that there is a continued uh, threat around you know shabab in somalia drc is really hotting up you know a lot of concern about a uh, rwanda Sort of, uh, supporting M23, I think is the name. Uh, the peacekeeping mission in Mali is, is severely threatened and remains the most dangerous. You know, people continue to be uh, affected by that. Um, what's the UN doing as a multilateral organization to, tal- to tackle uh, more transnational issues? And, and how much do you see there being prospects for that in the next two, uh, few months? Well, I mean, you, you point to a couple of cases which I think are very concerning. Um... Uh, you know, in Mali, uh, you have peacekeepers, you know, really struggling to handle a jihadi insurgency. And at the same time, the Malian government has invited in uh, Russian, Russian mercenaries, the, the Wagner group, um, who are fighting the same insurgents. And it's getting very, very messy and relations between the UN and the Malian government are not good. Um, similarly, in, in DRC, you've, you've had a peace operation that has been on the ground for the best part of a quarter of a century and um an italian suddenly... diplomat was killed wasn't he the, the uh, italian yes. ambassador was killed like two years ago when i first started working with you guys yes I remember that. A, 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 a tragic ambush Pro- probably yeah. not intentional but i mean you know this this i mean M- minusco um the un peace operation has been there for as I say, um, a quarter of a century, and yet now there's a new uh, sort of bout of violence in the east. You have a rebel group M23 that is, you know, fairly clearly supported, as you say, by um, uh, some of DRC's neighbours. Um, the population seems to have lost faith in the UN. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there've been angry protests outside UN bases. You've actually had UN peacekeepers shooting at civilians. I mean, this is a Wow. This is an, an awful, awful situation. And I think that in any other year, um, at any other time, we would be talking about a major crisis in peacekeeping. And um, the Security Council would be like heavily, heavily engaged in, you know, talking about whether to reinforce the peacekeepers or sort of other ways out of this problem. Now, in fairness, the Security Council ambassadors are going to the DRC next month in March to take mm-hmm. a look at what's happening on the ground. But everyone is re- realistic about this. The, 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 the UN system is so absorbed with Ukraine that it cannot devote time and energy to thinking creatively to do about uh, what to do, uh, what it should be doing in some of these other situations. And so I do worry that um, you will see more of these crises uh, breaking out. Um, you know, the UN struggling to hold the line in dealing with some of these crises. But uh, just because Ukraine takes up so much time and energy, the UN's response will um, be way, way below what is what is necessary. Um, and yes, Wagner is involved in a case like Mali, but you know most of these situations are not they're not part of some grand Cold War game. They're they're mm-hmm. local crises that are gaining intensity. Um, but because the big powers are focused on on Ukraine, they they get um, insufficient attention. So just to tag on to that then, um, before I ask my massive, well, it's not that big a deal. I just don't know why I'm building up so much. Um, <laughs> is what what's the likelihood we'll see a uh, an increase in sort of designation to regional organizations so we've seen this happen with au we saw them what um block out uh sudan after the coup in 2021 um we've seen asean try to be a little bit more proactive over myanmar which we had a conversation uh just two days ago and you can find the video for the for the myanmar coup two years on um on my youtube channel that i just uploaded this morning but what's the likelihood you'll see more of the regional sort of organizations taking on the mantle if that makes sense of the UN, maybe the UN provides some sort of overarching suggestions, but it's actually the AU that does the uh, the nitty gritty of the work, or is that just not really how international diplomacy and multilateralism works? No, I mean I think that's uh, you know I think there is a general feeling now around the UN that 
um, in future, uh, when you have a crisis in Africa, especially a crisis involving uh, a jihadi organization like Al Qaeda in the Maghreb, it should actually be the regional mm-hmm. countries that take the lead in dealing with that crisis. And Antonio Guterres was in uh, the Sahel last year. He went there actually immediately after visiting Moscow and Kiev uh, in April. And I think on, during that visit, he talked about the need to set up a new African counter-terrorism force in the Sahel. There's a sort of a feeling that you're only going to get workable peace enforcement operations if the country sending the soldiers really feel that it's in their interests to take risk. Right. And, you know, you have Indian and Pakistani um, peacekeepers in, in uh, the Congo who are very professional, but, you know, if you're sitting in New Delhi, you know, what happens in the Congo is not fundamentally posing an existential risk to you. Mm-hmm. And so it does, to some extent make, make, extent, make more sense to say, well, you should have African countries leading leading these operations where things may get pretty intense. The problem, as so often in the UN, is actually really money. Um, the <laughs> African Union says that it needs uh, the UN to pay in a systematic fashion for these sort of peace enforcement operations. Uh, there is a lot of interest in this. Um, oh, there are really? going to be talks about this in April, um, sort of creating a new um, funding framework for AU operations financed by the UN. Um, but the devil is in the detail and, you know, setting up a, a funding stream that is potentially being used to finance lethal force clearly raises lots of questions about human rights and, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, political oversight that you know still needs sorting out. So I, I think I think your basic assumption that we're moving into a world where regional actors take on more of a political load is, is correct. Um, but the technicalities continue to be problematic. As they ever do in the United Nations world, um, but I no, I um, I agree with that. Uh, so you're sort of saying pools of funding that are better distributed through separate streams, channels, that sort of thing. Last question for you, then, Richard, is is this: Why should we remain optimistic about the United Nations? Why should we? Uh, believe in the United Nations? And I know this is a very ridiculously big question for something, you know, that you could write books and obviously, you know, it's an entire lecture series about, but, you know, you, you touched upon it in your article, how when you were in Seoul, you are uh, sold, you know, you, you had someone comment on how you're actually sounding kind of optimistic about the UN, despite everything else that's going on in, well, the, uh, the, the first three years into the 2020s for, for three, four years has been pretty well, crap. Um, so you, but you remain relatively upbeat, cautiously, maybe optimistic, hopeful about the UN. Can you outline um, for us why? So, I mean, I'm generally quite a pessimistic person, and well, you're British, um, of course, you would be. Yeah, exactly. It comes from <laughs> the territory. No, look, I mean, I, uh, I did write this piece. Uh, this piece was actually for Horizons, um, a. Uh, okay. Uh, a journal where I, I write slightly longer things than the sort of short pieces for World Politics Review. Um, and I mean, the reason I said that I was feeling optimistic is is quite specific, and it, it starts actually from a fairly bleak place, which is, you know, a year ago in the weeks in the lead up to the 24th of February and, and Russia's assault on Ukraine, I, you know, I just didn't know. And I don't think anyone knew what would happen to the UN. As I said earlier in the the discussion, you know, it did seem possible that the Security Council would just become paralyzed because of big power tensions. The Secretary General, who, you know, has a reputation for caution, wouldn't be able to engage. We didn't know if you'd get real support for Ukraine in the General Assembly. Would a lot of countries just sort of try and duck out of out of sight when they saw this you know, big power contest bu- bubbling up? Um, and yeah, a year ago, I tended to be pretty gloomy about all those those questions and a year on i have to say you know the security council has clearly profoundly failed the people of ukraine but it has kept working as we've discussed on issues like afghanistan and syria uh the secretary general has carved out a niche it's only a niche but it is a real niche in diplomacy around the war and not very many other international diplomats can say that so i think Mm -hmm. he's he has performed and he has stepped up even if some would like him to step up further. And finally, coming right back to some of our 
our first points of discussion here, we've actually seen support in the General Assembly, support from the wider UN membership, staying pretty high for Ukraine. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of countries that don't want to offend Russia too much, that don't want to stick their neck out in New York and Geneva, but still look at the war and say, look, this is a basic, massive breach of the UN Charter. We need to side with the Ukrainians in some crunch votes. So for all those reasons, I am quite optimistic. I I mean, I, I think the UN has gone through a tough year, much better than I expected. I don't know what happens over the next 12 months. I don't know whether this sort of level of UN resilience will sustain or whether as the war drags on, we we will sort of see support for Kiev dissipating. For example, I think there's some, there are some diplomats from non-Western countries who now sort of say, well, you know, Kiev is an obstacle for peace because it's not accepting an immediate ceasefire. Oh, wow. Um, it, so it could be difficult going forward. Um, but the UN has performed better than I expected. That is why I feel optimistic. Um, I should say... If I was looking at other parts of the UN's performance, like how things are going in the fight against climate change, I I I'm I'm right back to being a profound pessimist. I I, (laughs) I think that on on climate change, on on achieving the famous sustainable development goals, things aren't looking very good right now. Um, You know, UN diplomatic processes like the COP process on climate change really seem to be um, failing to deliver. So, I mean, there's a lot about the multilateral system to be very, very worried about. But at least the whole thing didn't collapse um, at this, it, um, sort of in the wake of, of Russia's aggression. A lot of people in the foreign policy world over the last 30 years have given up on the UN. I mean, you know, there was Bosnia, there was Rwanda, there was Syria. Um, I think a lot of people who sort of think of themselves as you know serious security people uh, tend to dismiss the organization because they've, they've seen those failures. Um, you know what? What is striking, though, is that uh, there are times when they recognise that actually you do have to think about the UN, um, however unwillingly, and so that can be um, the fall of last year. Uh, sorry, the fall of the year before last. Now, fall of twenty twenty one, when uh, you know people dealing with Afghanistan realised that NATO was out of Afghanistan, the US was out of Afghanistan, the Taliban were in charge, but you needed someone to talk to the Taliban. Who was left? The UN. Um, and actually, the UN has been more significant in Afghanistan over the last 18 months as an interlocutor with the Taliban in very difficult conversations than it was um, prior to the fall of Kabul. Um, similarly, you know, over Ukraine, the General Assembly is not able to shape the war, um, but it is acting as a... Um, it is acting as a barometer of international opinion around the war you know countries don't want to legitimize as as state actors they don't want to legit there's this counterbalance of legitimizing the taliban too much um so the un is a sort of independent non-state actor even if it is a place where states come to visit uh is is often better placed uh, what i was <laughs> arguing was um uh that you know, the UN didn't seem very relevant in, in in Afghanistan until there was no one else able to talk to the Taliban. And frankly, you know, it's UN agencies now like UNICEF that are really helping prop up the country, although the moral dilemmas about working with the Taliban are huge. Um, similarly, you know, no one cares about General Assembly votes until they suddenly become sort of key tests of international opinion on Ukraine. So I do, I do find that, um, you know, it, it, People are interested in it. And I think right at the moment, because there's so much talk about, um, you know, a changing world order, redefinitions of multilateralism, China's rise, you know, diplomats in places like DC, London, you know, they may not focus on the UN all the time, but they are interested in the UN's place in this changing world order. So I do end up discussing it quite a lot. Um, Equally, in our work at Crisis Group, um, you know, we also spend a lot of time talking to diplomats and other colleagues about more technical questions. You know, how do you strengthen peacekeeping in Mali? Uh, what can the UN do to try and sort of re- revive um, uh, sort of diplomacy about the reunification of Cyprus? Um, so it's not all the high level geopolitical stuff, but it, it, in a moment like the present, the UN is there still as a bit of a geopolitical lightning rod.
you know, as you know, we've had a lot of spaces on Iran, um, hosted a lot of speakers, uh, and that includes one next week with Nadav Iyal. Uh, he's the foreign correspondent for Channel 13 of Israel. Uh, we'll be talking about the recent likely strikes by Israel in Iran. Um, so do look out for that if you follow Iran or are interested in that. But as for today, I want to thank uh, very much uh, Richard for his uh, great time, fantastic um, outfit, hairdo, looking just uh, really on point, Richard. For those of you listening on YouTube uh, and watching, thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Um, everything else of that vibe, you know, share it around. Uh, we'll be back with another episode soon. Uh, thank you very much to all of you uh, uh, as well, and uh, see you soon.